If one were to go into nearly any science classroom in the developed world, I would argue that one is likely to find two things, almost without fail. One of these things would be that most ubiquitous of organizing principles, the periodic table, a tool dating back to 1870 in something like its modern form, though, as we've discussed, it has origins in work going back earlier than that. The other would be a length of wood, or metal, or plastic, that is ruled into first 100 even divisions, with each of these most likely divided again into 10 even parts. Even in the United States, where this particular instrument of science is not yet recognized as an official standard, this measure has replaced all vestiges of a system still rooted in its colonial period and thus known as imperial, at least in the science laboratory and classroom. The meter stick is the standard measuring tool in that science lab. From it are derived, at least historically, all of the other fundamental units of the old metric system, and now the more recent international system of units, excepting those related to time and electric charge. But what is a meter? Where does it come from? When a student takes up the length of wood or metal to find the distance between two points, what exactly is she comparing that distance to? The answer to this question is rooted in one of the most audacious and ideological scientific journeys ever conceived. Born out of the fires of that most complicated of liberal revolutions, the quest to define the meter, which by the way was declared by Napoleon, still first consul rather than emperor, as being for all men, for all time. It almost never happened and was nearly thrown away by the very country that called it forth. The meter in the system it defines is a product of revolution and it would generate a revolution in science, unknown to the two men whose efforts to define it would be doomed to a sort of failure that would both help give rise to a branch of mathematics and define the modern practice of science in the form used today. In this episode of the Scientific Odyssey, we examine the origins of the meter. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 38, Digression. For all men, for all time. As I begin this episode, let me set forth just a couple of things. The first is that this digression, as I have called it, from our ongoing narrative of humanity finding its place both in the cosmos and in due course on the earth, is an outgrowth of a talk I'm giving at the American Association of Physics Teachers 2017 summer meeting. In fact, right now as I record this, I'm sitting in a hotel room in Florence, Kentucky. So if the, you know, audio quality here is a little weird, it's because basically I'm sitting in front of a hard mirror and the sound is just bouncing all over the place. I hope you can forgive that. Now, in this talk, as I only have about eight minutes to tell this story and examine its important consequences there, I thought it would be good to give a fuller account of the events in a, this podcast format. So, if you're coming to the show through that avenue of my talk at the American Association of Physics Teachers Summer Meeting, welcome aboard the Odyssey. Perhaps, when you're done listening to this, you can take a look at a few of our other episodes. The other thing I need to say is that, since much of the story takes place during the French Revolution, those of you who are fans of Mike Duncan's Revolution podcast will likely hear some familiar names and events. 
While I don't want to sound too fanboyish about all of this, perhaps this episode can serve as something of an appendix to Mike's very deep dive into the political, economic, and military exposition of that grand story. Mike didn't talk at much length about the scientific work being done during the period covered by his series, and I hope that this episode will fill in that gap just a little bit. Finally, the subject I am venturing into here is one where there is a bit of controversy. While there is some ongoing consternation about whether the United States is clinging to some backwards and outdated practice by remaining, at least officially, with the old British imperial system of units with its feet and pounds and gallons, that's really not what I'm talking about here. The bigger controversy is whether or not the international system of units or its predecessor, the original metric system, is a superior system of units in some way. While I argue that it is, for a variety of reasons, there are those who claim, with some good arguments, that such distinctions are merely a matter of preference, something related to culture or tradition. I really don't want to get too far into the weeds of that debate here, though I will mention it just a little bit towards the end of the episode. My hope with this episode is to talk about why having a single set of units is important and then give the history of where the metric system comes from. So, with those preliminaries out of the way, where do we start? A good place, I think, is let's start at your local clothing outlet. Maybe it's online, maybe it's a department store, maybe it's a big box discount retailer. I don't know, wherever you like to shop for clothes. Now, when I think of buying clothes, I imagine racks and racks of shirts that come in various sizes from, say, extra small to extra, extra large. The problem is that I've learned through experience that these size distinctions or sort of labeling can actually be pretty misleading. Hence, many of the physical stores that sell shirts have dressing rooms where you can try a shirt on to see if it fits. Now this strikes me, and perhaps you as well, as rather absurd. If I want to buy a shirt, shouldn't I know how big it is just by looking at the label? Shouldn't a large just be a large? Well, if you've been clothes shopping, you know that's just not how it works. Different clothing manufacturers seem to have different standards they use to determine whether there's a shirt is a medium or a large, an extra large or a small. In fact, if you've done a lot of shirt shopping, you know that even within a single manufacturer, there might be actually a lot of variation. Hence, a trip to the fitting room with an armload of shirts is always on tap when I go clothes shopping. And by the way, woe be unto he or she who skips this retail ritual, for verily shall ye arrive at home to find a shirt that you knew was going to fit that's either too small, in fact, so small that you might, you know, rip it to shreds like the Incredible Hulk if you move just wrong, or at the other extreme, you'll wonder if you purchased a small tent by mistake. What we've got here is an example of a unit problem. Every manufacturer has their own standards for sizes. A large from one maker isn't the same as a large from another. And this is analogous to what happens in all pre-scientific and pre-commercial cultures as they try to grapple with the move from the hunter-gatherer stage to what might be called civilization with things like agriculture and trade. What arises in this transition is a need to measure, and to measure according to some kind of standard. Whether that's the size of a plot of land, or the length of a bolt of fabric, or the amount of wine or oil in a jug, there eventually comes a point when there's a need to know how much there is in terms everybody can understand. Now, I don't want to get too far into the history of unit development here, as that would cause this episode to balloon into some sort of a multi-part series. But what really spurs this whole discussion forward are two things. The first is the rise of coinage and the move away from a strictly barter economy. As first, pieces of precious metal, and then later, pieces of paper, begin to substitute for a product of a day of a person's labor, there arises a need to have a sense of just what a certain amount of that labor substitute, i.e. the coinage, will buy. The second thing is the centralization of authority into some sort of larger governmental type of system. If you're just trading with a couple of your neighbors, the barter system works just fine. 
But if you're going to create a bigger political entity than, say, a clan or maybe a tribe, and with that you have to have things like markets and taxation, you've got to develop some standard, some kind of way in which trade can be more equitably conducted. And you've also got to create a way of measuring just how much something is or how much of something is produced so that the central authority can ask for a certain amount in order to fulfill its roles in society, i.e. figure out how much it wants to tax you. What this means is that whatever measurement units get developed, they're going to grow organically and locally and not, by the way, just within some sort of individual community structure. They're also going to grow out of things like trade associations, such as guilds or professional organizations, whatever you might have. What that means is they're going to reflect the customs and values of those local communities and the people that make them up. What this also means is they may not really be as uniform as you or my, I might expect them to be. A great example of this can be seen in how one measures an area of land for cultivation. Today, when we do this, we use hectares or acres, and the size of those things are pretty standardized. A hectare in the countryside outside of Paris is the same as a hectare near, near Lyon or Marseille. The same is true for an acre in Albany, New York, Albany, Georgia, or Albany, Oregon. But this is a very modern invention, it turns out. This standardization of the size of a unit is a result of a shift in economic theory that says that price is the negotiable quantity in an assessment of value or in a transaction. Until the late 18th and early 19th century, there actually was a very different view of how economies worked. Prior to that, what was held fixed was the value of a person's labor. In this sense, when one might measure out a plot of land, that plot might be measured in terms of the amount a single person could plow in a day given the tools commonly available. So what this led to was that a given unit of area might change depending on just how easy that was to do. If a person lived on a fertile lowland valley, maybe with soft soils and flat terrain, their quote unquote acre might be bigger than someone's who had to plow rocky and difficult land up on a hillside where they had to haul a whole bunch of equipment. This sort of economy was known as a quote-unquote just price economy. And the idea here is everything was based on what the average person could produce in a day's labor or afford to buy with the pay for that labor. In this sort of an economy, it's generally the price that was set say the monetary unit that was equivalent to one-tenth of a day's labor for a typical person in a community for a given commodity, say perhaps the cost of a measure of flour or a given weight of bread. When the law of supply and demand drove up the cost of a good, say how expensive it was to buy the grain to make the loaf, the baker didn't actually charge more for the bread, instead he made a smaller loaf. In this way, the units in a just price economy would be kind of fungible to some degree and very much based on the local economic environment. In this sort of economy, price controls, or perhaps a better way to think of it might be portion controls, are enforced more by public pressure than local authority. If the bakers in an area begin to bake loaves that are too small for the workmen who go into the fields to harvest their grain, it wasn't out of the realm of possibility that those workers might one day march into town and take matters into their own hands, as it were. The downside of this, though, is that you really get this massive proliferation of units. What happens is, first, each region develops its own set of units. The example of a unit of area for measuring of land is really kind of a good one in this case. You know, the folks in Lyon are going to have a different unit because, you know, they may be able to plow a lot more land in a day than the folks in Marseille or the folks in Paris. Moreover, though, even within a community, there may be different units for different trades and professions. In other words, a foot or yard of cloth is probably not going to be the same length as a foot or yard of lumber. A pound of wheat is not going to actually weigh exactly the same as a pound of coal. And this, of course, assumes that different areas of trade are even using remotely the same units to measure the same kinds of things. To this, 
there are a myriad of other factors that combine to create just this huge mess of units. So why was or is this a bad thing? If you're working in a local economy where everyone knows more or less what's going on, it's really actually not that big a deal. You're trading with your neighbors and, you know, money just serves as something to help ease that barter system. However, in the 1500s, with the rise of the nation-state and the development of a real sense of international commerce on a scale that had been unseen since the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, this starts to become a liability. It's a lot harder to have a national economy when every little town has its own way of measuring stuff, and what ends up happening is that if you want to convert the units in your town or region to the units of another town, it's going to end up costing you a little bit of money to pay that local exchange official to take care of that for you. What that means, of course, is that all of this starts to become a drag on the long, larger economy. It also hinders the national government's ability to collect taxes in a uniform and what might be thought of, at least in one sense, a fair way. All of this is a lead up to say that by the period coming into the French Revolution, the national government in Paris had a real problem on its hands. As Mike Duncan laid out in the second episode of his Revolution series on the French Revolutions, the nation really was this poorly organized hodgepodge of overlapping administrative, judicial, and ecclesial district that seemed to be designed more than anything to protect privileges, restrict free trade, and defy rationalization. What Mr. Duncan's analysis left out was the contribution the staggering number of units made to all of this. At the time of the French Revolution, it's been conservatively estimated that there were over 250,000 different units for weight and measure being used regularly throughout the country. Think about that. 250,000 different things like cups and yards and feet and meters and whatever else you might have. So now, a wine merchant in Bordeaux certainly didn't have to deal with all of these. But as he began to try to sell his products in markets further and further away from his vineyard, he had to deal with more and more of them and thus had to pay more in taxes and, con and conversion fees to transport and sell his wine. While this tended to protect local markets, which is great if you're in a small local economy, it acted as a huge damper on national economic growth. Moreover, it also impeded progress and communication for scientific and industrial purposes. If a land surveyor measured the length of, say, an old Roman road, what units did he actually do it in? Whose mile, if we want to use that terminology, did he use? If the guy had been sent by the national government, he probably used the national standard, but if he was a local surveyor, which was more than likely the case, he might not actually do that. What was even worse is that he might not explicitly say in his report, and so when someone 5 or 10 or 15 years later had read an account of his measurement, they were left with an uncertainty about what that value actually was. The other issue that you're going to run into here is you're going to have a problem in competing on the international scale. In places like Britain, where they had at least standardized their units, even if they don't standardize them to the level that you'll see in the metric system down the road, they're able to sort of always have the same standard, which allows for things to be manufactured all to the same set of specifications. This allows for an industrialization of the processes of manufacture, where people can be brought into factories, they can do their manufactures in stock ways, and everything goes much more quickly and thus products are produced more cheaply. When those products are released out into the international marketplace, they just, you know, they're just so much cheaper than those products produced by small manufacturers in little towns, all with different units, where nothing seems to match. And so what you have in France is a nightmare. However, as was the case with so many things, the forces in the Enlightenment were beginning to apply their pressures of rationalization to the issue. So 
when we talk about the desire to create a standard system of units, an agreed upon way of measuring, it was the philosophes and physiocrats who began to press for reform. As France fell further and further behind its more economically enlightened neighbors, the British and the Dutch, it was understood that there was a need for more open markets and for that to occur there needed to be a single standard set of units. As we will see, while men like Lavoisier would see this very clearly and so push policy in that direction, the local regions aren't going to be very keen on these men who were divorced from the day-to-day -day realities of making a living from the earth and the guys in Paris telling them to discard their treasured local standards. At this point in our story, it's useful to introduce the man who would be central to the early efforts to get things moving. Joseph Jérôme Lalande, he was an astronomer and a philosopher. He was a popularizer of science and a proponent of rationism, rationalism. As much as Voltaire in letters or Rousseau in politics, Lalande was one of the primary enlightenment voices in terms of advancing the idea that science had a central role in a rational society. On the other hand, he was also a short, profoundly ugly, and extraordinarily vain man who was both an avid atheist and an unrepentant self-promoter who styled himself as the quote-unquote most famous astronomer in the world, even while living at the same time as the Cassini family that had run the Paris Observatory for four generations. And yet, even with all of these drawbacks, he was the foremost scientist in Paris during his life, a reputation he had earned through a number of different contributions, including being an exceptional teacher. His textbook on astronomy would become the standard for a generation, and so it was that by the 1780s he had trained France's next generation of astronomers and geometers, two of whom will be of particular importance to our story. Lalande was also a strong proponent of unit reform. Now, unlike many of those who saw the need to base any standard system of units on an even greater or more fundamental standard that would be available to all researchers, Lalande was more of a pragmatic man who felt that it was only really important that everybody actually just use the same units, whatever they happened to be. Hence, he tended to advocate that everybody use a set of units that would be called from those units used in Paris for each type of thing, i.e. length and weight, volume, etc., and then to have those things pushed out into the surrounding countryside, kind of like the British had done. However, there had been a conversation among the Enlightenment figures of the period that whatever unit standard was developed, it should be tied to something just more rational than just picking a set of units sort of out of a phone book, as it were. While a number of ideas were advanced, there were two that really gained traction. The first was to use the earth itself. In the middle of the 18th century, the Cassinis at Paris Observatory had undertaken a scientific mission to measure the size of the earth and, just as importantly, the shape of the earth. Newton's Principia and the work he had done in there had predicted that due to its rotation, the earth would be slightly flattened at its poles. Subsequent analysis by some later physicists had suggested that perhaps Newton had made an error and that the Earth would actually be elongated at the poles. The first we call oblate, the second we call prolate. To resolve this question, two teams were sent out to make measurements, one near the Earth's equator and the other to Lapland as close to the pole as they could get. The goal was to physically measure the actual length of one degree of latitude at each location. Now, if those two measurements came out the same, that would mean the Earth was probably a perfect sphere. But if one were longer than the other, then that would determine whether or not Newton had been right. After overcoming a variety of, of obstacles that were kind of typical of this sort of expedition, the results showed conclusively that the Earth was oblate or flattened at the poles, just as Newton predicted. Cassini's mission was to determine to a high degree of accuracy, at least as high a, de a degree as was available to him at the time, exactly how squashed the Earth was by surveying in great detail the meridian line that ran from Dunkirk in the north to Barcelona in the south that went through Paris. 
This segment would be enough to allow mathematicians to calculate the true size of the Earth's dimensions and represent its shape as sort of a mathematically idealized figure. This survey was completed in 1740, and as momentum picked up to define a standard unit of length, it was suggested that the unit be some fraction of the Paris meridian measure in terms of tying it to the size of the Earth. Now, the other idea was to use a pendulum. As we discussed way back in our earliest episodes related to Galileo, the period of a pendulum's oscillation had been shown to depend only on the pendulum's length if the size of the pendulum's oscillation was sufficiently small. In the intervening years, and with the work of Newton, it came to be understood that the period of oscillation was also dependent on the strength of the Earth's gravitational pull. The idea in this case was to define a standard unit of length on the basis of the length of string that would result in the pendulum bob passing through the vertical line once per second. This actually is a pretty easy thing to measure, but there are a couple of complications with it. And by the way, if you do this, that ends up turning out to be just about what we think of as a meter in length now. It's a little bit different, or for those of you working in imperial units, it's about 39.2 inches. So the first of the complications was that it had to be done in a specific place. The higher one went above sea level, the weaker the pull of gravity became even if only by a tiny amount. And by the way, it is really a tiny amount, but that's the level of precision these guys want to go for by this point. The other issue was that due to the Earth's rotation, there would be what you can think of as a latitude effect. In other words, you'll get slightly different results depending on whether you're at a latitude close to the equator or something closer to the pole. Now, the best way to compensate for this would be to take measurements at sea level and at the equator, but the emerging economic powers of Northern Europe and more recently the United States felt that this was a bit too far away and too difficult to obtain good data from, especially if you had to go repeat the experiment later on. So with these two ideas floating about sort of being talked about among the scientific and philosophical circles, France fell deeper and deeper into financial crisis. And this is something Mike Duncan talks about in those early episodes of his Revolutions podcast series. While much of this had to do with ineptitude and an unwillingness on the part of those in positions of power to give up their privileges, it has to be noted that the units issue was a significant contributing factor. England had standardized its units. Incidentally, much in the way Leland had suggested, and its colonies, or former colonies in the case of the United States, had adopted that system as well. This allowed England to take a lead in the move towards industrialized manufacturing, especially in things like textiles, as we discussed a little earlier in the episode. A yard was a yard everywhere in England, so things could be produ produced to that standard on a larger scale at cheaper prices in factory. This pushed less competitive countries, such as France, out of international markets and thus contributed to the worsening financial crisis. When Louis XVI was finally forced to call the Estates General in 1789, he asked for a list of grievances to be produced for the Estates to consider. On that list was a call for a national system of units. As things gathered steam and the Estates General transformed into the National Assembly, the feudal rights of the nobility were either voluntarily surrendered, at least early on, or later stripped. Among these was the right to set and maintain units of weights and measures in the lands they had once controlled. This finally opened the way for a real consideration of a standard unit system. The first report to this effect was presented to the Assembly in 1790 by Charles Maurice de Talleyrand, still, by the way, at this time, known as the Bishop of Autun. He recommended a decimal-based system of interlocking units with everything being based on a standardized length. In August of that year, Louis XVI authorized a commission to be established to create such a system. Now, as part of the rhetoric of the French Revolution, there was a desire that whatever standard was developed would come from something that belonged to all men, something in that spirit of fraternité, liberté, equalité. 
This more or less ruled out Lalande's idea of just sort of pushing out the units used in Paris, though he would continue to advocate for that approach as other efforts floundered. The early front runner actually was the pendulum method, because that's actually what Talleyrand recommended. And in the spirit of a truly international effort, representatives of the new national government of France approached both the British and France's sister republic in America, and both indicated a strong willingness to become part of an effort based on that idea. After hashing out just where that measurement might take place, see, things seemed to be moving towards an agreement when, unfortunately, the first major objections got raised. The problem with the pendulum method was that the length of the standard unit of distance ended up being dependent on the length of the standard unit of time. Unfortunately, since a second was defined as 1 86,400th of a day, this actually turns out to be a problem. The issue is that the day isn't actually a standard length. Due to the fact that the Earth speeds up and slows down ever so slightly in its revolution around the Sun due to its elliptical orbit, the length of a day is just a little bit longer in February when the Earth is closer to the Sun by a few million miles than it is in August when the Earth is further away from the Sun. Now, this isn't a huge deal, certainly not anything more than having to decide on a latitude at which the measurement would take place. In other words, one could agree to make the measurement from the pendulum on the vernal equinox, for example. But it threw enough doubt into the idea that the tide of philosophical opinion turned towards using the meridian method. Now the problem was going to be which meridian to use, and the French really insisted on using that Paris meridian, the one that the Cassinis had measured. This was really more than the British and the Americans could take, especially as the French Revolution continued to take a more and more radical path, and so they sort of bailed out on the whole project. The National Assembly, however, decided to go ahead with the plan that the new meter be one ten millionth the distance from the equator to the North Pole on the meridian that passed from Barcelona through Paris up to Dunkirk. In October of 1790, this was the recommendation of the Commission on Weights and Measures that Louis XVI had established and that consisted of the greatest scientific minds in France at the time. Now, at this point, I do think it's useful to make a decision as to what we will call these guys, and by the way, they were, for the most part, men at this point. While we probably would think of them as scientists today, at least if we watched their activities, that's not actually what they were called then. The reason for this was that while much of what we think of as the process of scientific inquiry was in place by that time, there were still a couple of important pieces missing. One of those was that there was no standard way to account for and characterize error. The second was that most of these investigators thought of data as being something that belonged to them and their very small class of practitioners, a bit like secret knowledge of a guild, if you will. As such, there was not the same type of sharing of data and information, especially in France, that would come to be part of a later scientific practice. Now, yes, they certainly shared data and information with each other, but they didn't share it with public or even with the governmental institutions or the other funding sources that might actually pay for their investigations. Thus, what I found in all of the reading that I've done is that the practice is to refer to these in his investigators as what might be called savants. So when I say savant, I want you to understand that's really, these are scientists we're talking about, but they're scientists in terms of what science was then and not quite what we think of as science now. Hence, in October of 1790, when the commission made its recommendation, it was a commission of savants, well-versed in their practice, who were recommending the path by which they would produce the standard for the nation. As a part of this, they recommended that the system be a decimal one, as Talleyrand had suggested, wherein divisions and multiplications of the meter and its derived units would be expressed in powers of 10. These would have the appropriate Greek prefixes, and so 1,000 of something would have the prefix kilo attached to it, while divisions of 100 would be preceded by the centi. Hence, you have things like kilometers and centimeters. 
This was also to be extended to the monetary system as well and down the road to time itself. So here's where things take kind of an interesting turn. One can argue that with the Cassini survey of 1740, the nation of France already had a measure of the earth, and so why not just go with that? However, as is often the case in such matters, there was a push towards an even higher standard of accuracy so as to aid scientific investigation. This is what happens when you put accuracy-obsessed savants in charge of making decisions for a unit system instead of folks, say, from commerce and industry who would likely have thought that what they had was probably good enough. This was aided by the fact that one of the members of the commission, Jean-Charles de Borda, had invented a new surveying instrument. Now, Borda was a veteran naval commander, and he was France's leading experimental physicist, and his instrument was known as the repeating circle. The repeating circle was the most advanced scientific instrument of its day, able to achieve accuracies that were an order of magnitude greater than anything previously available in terms of the measurement of angle, able to be operated in a horizontal position for field surveying or vertical position for astronomical observation, the instrument achieved its precision through a process known as angle doubling. While the details are probably a bit too complicated to try and describe in this podcast format, what the repeating circle allowed the surveyor to do was to fix the location of one thing, say a church steeple, in one telescopic site, let's say the one on the right, and then fix another different thing at a different location, let's say this time it's a fortress tower, in another telescopic site. Now, usually that was all you could do, and so what you do is you'd fix your two sort of telescopic sites at those two things, and then what you would do is you'd read an angle off of a scale, and that would give you the angle of one vertex of a surveying triangle in a process known as triangulation. You repeat this over and over again, you do some trigonometry on the triangles that you build where you know the angles, and all of a sudden, as long as you know one side of those triangles, any one of those triangles by the way, you can then calculate sort of all of the sides of the triangles, and thus find a distance. What the repeating circle did was to put the two telescopic sites on movable rings that could be alternately locked either one to the other when that was needed. What the surveyor would do is lock the right scope and turn the rings until the left scope looked at the church steeple, that thing that had been on the right. Then the left scope would be locked and the right scope unlocked and that would be turned to look at the fortress tower. By doing this multiple times, the surveyor would multiply the angle between those two scopes repeatedly. Once he'd done this, say, 10 times, he would have a total number up for an angle that was 10 times bigger than the actual angle, so we could just take that and divide it by 10. Now, at first, this may not seem like a big deal. You know, you've got a number, you've made the angle 10 times too big, you divide by 10, what's the big deal? The thing that's important here, though, is in doing that, not only do you divide the angle by 10, you divide the instrument uncertainty by 10 as well, thus dramatically improving the instrument's precision. The accuracy of these instruments, when used correctly, was astonishing. When Delambre, whom we'll introduce here in a moment, used the repeating circle to establish the latitude of his northernmost observing point in Dunkirk, he was able to establish it by at least one account that I've read to within four meters of his actual position, a number comparable to most commercially available GPS units today. Such an instrument, something Borda had just invented, would allow for a more accurate determination of the length of the Paris meridian, and so it was decided that the distance would be resurveyed. Given the need for haste and the difficulties involved, two savants were selected to lead missions to the north and south that would work back towards the center. Both of the men selected had been students discovered by Lalande. Pierre-Francois Michon and Jean-Baptiste Joseph de Lambre. Both men had risen from modern, modest, I should say, backgrounds through hard work and a devotion to detail that had impressed Lalande, and so he had promoted their careers throughout their, you know, their rise through the ranks until they had been elected to the French Academy of Sciences. <laughs> 
They had worked in surveying and geodesy for a number of years, and when the fourth Cassini indicated he had really no interest in traipsing through the French countryside as, as his father and grandfather had, they were given the jobs. I don't have time to go into the specifics of the personality of the two men or the trials and tribulations of their mission, which began in 1792. For those who'd like to read a really wonderful, in-depth account, Ken Adler's book, The Measure of All Things, is, I think, the best work on the topic available. It centers the discussion around the seven-year ordeal Michon and Delambre endured as they made their triangulation measurements across a war-torn and increasingly hostile France that would, within a year of their outset, devolve into terror and then into counter-revolution. The pressures of achieving a new standard of precision and accuracy would wear on both men, and it would turn out that Michon would suffer greatly due to his melancholic nature and his inability to recognize the source of an error that was introduced in the latitude measurements he made in Barcelona. This error would result eventually in the meter standard they produced being off its intended target by about 0 .013 millimeters or the thickness of about three pieces of paper. This error, by the way, would torment Michon, who held tightly to the savant's way of seeing data. Delambre, on the other hand, managed to make the transition to a more modern view of the data being the data, in other words, data's data, it's not wrong, it's not right, it's just data, and then working with that to do the best one could. The two men would survive arrest and imprisonment on multiple occasions, and got lucky enough to manage to be out of Paris when the reign of terror occurred, and thus were likely spared an appointment with Madame Guillotine. The outcome of this effort was somewhat disappointing and more than just a bit surprising. In the period during which the survey was suspended, something that happened between you know, 1793 and 1795 when the terror and counter-revolution was taking place, and while the two men hid out while France tore itself apart and warred with its neighbors, the Committee on Public Safety pushed forward with a plan to replace the old units with a provisional meter based on the 1740s survey data. When the counter-revolution occurred and the Jacobins were purged from the French government, the survey was put back into motion and it was finally finished. With the establishment of the directory, the final data was gathered and in 1799, the calculations to come up with the meter were done. And from this, there were really two res surprising results. The first was that the Earth was found to be actually a lot more oblate than was previously thought, about twice as much as a matter of fact. But the other thing is that it was also seen that the shape of the Earth could not be modeled to follow a relatively simple mathematical figure. What this meant was that if measurements had been done using a different meridian, say the meridian running through Berlin or the meridian running through, I don't know, Philadelphia, it would have been found that that meridian had a slightly different result for the distance from the equator to the pole. In other words, the Earth was too lumpy for a single meridian to describe all of its shape. And this invalidated one of the underlying goals of using this based on the Earth method to establish the meter. Moreover, while the border repeating circle was a masterpiece of engineering design and technology, it was heavy and required the observers to be at a relatively high altitude to take advantage of its strengths. This meant that many of the observations had been taken at the tops of sort of like rickety bell towers or church steeples or while on the tops of fairly windy mountains, especially in the observations made in the Massif Central. Thus, while the instrument's uncertainty was very small, the environment often introduced errors that could not easily be eliminated. Thus, while the latitude measurements were, were of extraordinarily high precision, the triangulation measurements suffered from greater error. As such, the final meter turned out to be less accurate than the provisional one created from the Cassini survey data. Nevertheless, with great fanfare, the meter was defined in 1799 as being, as we said, for all men, for all time. In the words of Napoleon, just before he headed off to his disastrous campaign in Egypt. Mm -hmm.
The difficulty we now encounter is that while declaring a standards unit is one thing, getting people to use it is another thing entirely. As President Jimmy Carter learned, a government can decree that a new system of units will become the standard, but that doesn't make it so in the mind of a nation's citizens. The metric system would become the language of the savants, and then, as this transition took place, the scientists, in a relatively quick fashion, even as a few of them, such as Cassini and even the land, held out. The data from the metric survey would even be used by both Legendre and Gauss to develop the method of least squares fit that would become the cornerstone of the new mathematical discipline we call statistics that would help science redefine how to characterize error. In France and its conquered territories, the meter would mix w meet with mixed reception. While some would welcome it as a way to rein in the abuses of less than scrupulous merchants and tradesmen, many of the local departments would resent the imposition of a new economical model that forced them to negotiate on the basis of price rather than quantity. The new unit system forced them away from the age-old tie to a day's work and a day's wage. As such, France, after initially adopting the system, would over time step back from the unit it had created. Changing the way humanity measured both, measures both its experience and its world is not a simple thing and it would take time to implement. Created during the revolution, the meter would be abandoned during Napoleon's first empire. When that was overthrown and the Bourbons were restored, Louis XVIII was loath to have anything to do with something created by the forces that had killed his brother. And so the meter languished until the revolution of 1830 and the bourgeois monarchy of Louis Philippe. In 1837, the government revived the meter as both an economic necessity for a nation still falling behind the other industrialized powers in Europe and as a way to identify with the revolution many still felt had done much to improve the lives of the common citizen. In this effort, it was the rising tide of nationalism that created the impetus for readoption of the meter. The effort to make the measurements to create the unit had been enormous and unique to the forces of the revolution. If France was to realize its greatness as a nation, it was argued, it must take hold of that which was truly its own. In that year, it was decreed by the national legislature that France would return to the meter by January 1st of 1840. Even with this, though, adoption was slow, with citizens in Amiens still using old units to measure, the cloth, to measure cloth as late as 1900. But really, these were last gasp holdouts that would basically disappear by the time of World War I. By the time, though, that France had decided to return to the meter, Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg had already decided to go that route. As Italy began its long process towards unification, it adopted the system in 1863, having originally gotten exposed to it during Napoleon's conquests. In 1852, Spain and Portugal, along with all of their worldwide colonies, adopted the metric system. With this tide of adoption taking hold and the rise of a standardized and industrialized world, it was inevitable that a standard unit would have to be adopted in each country. Not to do so was to consign oneself to an economic backwater. As revolutions continued to topple old governments, new regimes sought ways to break with the old and often oppressive practices, and the metric system gave them a way to do that. In 1872, when Germany unified, the metric system was adopted for both of those reasons. In time, the metric system would be redefined. Among the primary topics of discussion at the first International Geodetic Conference, which was held in Berlin in 1867, was whether the meter was a French unit or an international one. Was it tied to some universally accepted standard or to a bar of platinum locked away in a government building somewhere in Paris? While these questions were provisionally settled in favor of the status quo, the rising rivalry between Germany and France would keep them on the scientific front burner for the next th three decades. 
It's at this point that we've really reached the end of our time. So let me make just a few concluding remarks. As science moved from the realm of classical to modern physics, there came to the fore a need to rethink the basis for the standard definition of the meter. With Einstein's work in relativity and the Cavendish's lab's work in things like elementary particles and quantum mechanics, it became clear that it would be possible to redefine units not in terms of earthly dimensions, but with fundamental constants of the universe, things like the charge of an electron or the speed of light. Additionally, as an understanding of electricity and magnetism expanded, there was a need to expand the metric system. Thus, throughout the 20th century, there were refinements to that system. The first was to add more units and more completely think through which things should be the basis for measurement. And so in the early 1900s, the international system of units was agreed upon by many nations. Later, throughout the 60s and 70s, there were efforts made to define both the second and the meter in terms of the speed of light. The only holdout of the international system of units from this process was the kilogram. Still defined by an actual physical artifact, there are efforts underway right now that will redefine the kilogram in terms of quantum mechanical values. As one of the things actually that I hope to take away from the conference I'm at this weekend is a report on that effort that will be given just before my talk. I'll be sure to update you all on the results of that and what I learned in our next episode. As always, thanks for listening to the Scientific Odyssey. I hope you've enjoyed this digression, and next week we'll finish up our series on the Harvard calculators and then get back to the story of locating our place in the cosmos. So until next time, full sails on your journey. <laughs>